Wanna sound like a professional? The Merge Studio should be your next stop. A private, intimate environment by invite only. Our engineer has years of experience mastering mix downs, production, and beats. Available all in our one stop shop of entertainment. Merge Studios, let us help you sound the best, be the best, and beat the rest. Together at Merge Studios. How you doing? Welcome to Ralph Reed. Brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. The legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal Ronin Ralph. Your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On this episode of Ralph Reads, I reintroduce a guy called Midnight and the Meaning of Love. This is Book One. Written by the New York Times bestselling author, Sister Soldier. Put down the guns and pick each other up. Put the love back in the air and somehow make it stay there. Let the reading commence. Show love. Love is a powerful emotion, propelled by energy, thought, and action. It can change you and anyone around you who you love. Love needs no announcement. It is visible in the eyes and body and deeds of everyone who loves. If you cannot see love through action, it is not love. It's something else. If an elder loves you, she and he and they will prepare you to do well in life. If an elder abuses you, confuses you, misuses you, it's wrong and it is certainly not love. Elders who do not love lose their authority and influence over you because they are corrupt and unable. It is an elder's job to share wisdom and not conceal it, destroy it, deny it, or distract you from it. Here are my jewels to you, the young all around the world, in any and every place, no matter the faith or politic. You are not too young to love. Intelligence is the ability to solve problems. Wisdom is experience along with intelligence. Ignorance is not knowing better. Evil is knowing better, but doing wrong anyway, while influencing others to do the same. Vanity is uselessness. A n is any person of any race who refuses to learn, grow, and change. Arrogance is thinking and acting like you are better than others without true or good reason. Look toward God above every elder, and even your parents, and all of your community. God is first, the maker of your soul, in every religion, and in every corner of the world. God is the reason for you and I to be humble, and live respectfully. God is love. Sister Soldier A Brooklyn Story Seven Days in Brooklyn Chapter 1 
warm-hearted and young, armed and dangerous. I was moving my guns and weapons out of my Brooklyn apartment to one of my most reliable stash spots. As heavy as they were, my thoughts were heavier and even more deadly. I was trying to move murder off my mind. Kidnapping is a bullshit English word. It doesn't convey the insult that the offense carries. When a man invades another man's home, f***s with his family or wife, la kada Allah, God forbid, and steals away. The man whose wife is gone stands there trying to push the puzzle pieces together of where his wife is exactly and what happened exactly. His blood begins to boil, thicken, curdle, and even starts to choke him. That's why for me, kidnapping and murder go hand in hand. In my case, my young wife, Akemi's kidnapper, is her own father, her closest blood relation, a man who she loves and honors. For me to kill him would be to lose her even if I win her back. And I refuse to lose. Ektetaf is our word for kidnapping. My Uma pushed it out from her pretty lips. She pulled it from her soul and gave it the true feeling that it carried for us. The hurt. The shame. Violation. An insult. For half a day, it was all that she said after I relayed to her that Akemi was gone. My new wife had been taken against her will back to Japan without a chance to express herself to us, her new family face to face. For me to see my mother Uma's Sudanese eyes filled with tears tripled my trauma. I had dedicated my young life to keeping the water out of my mother's eyes and returning a measure of joy to her heart that life had somehow stolen. But Sunday night, when our home phone finally rang and Uma answered only to hear the silence of Akemi's voice and the gasp in Akemi's breathing and the restraint in Akemi's crying, Uma's tears did fall. There was a furious rainstorm that same Sunday. Everything was soaked, the afternoon sky had blackened and then bled at sunset. So did Uma's eyes switch from sunlight to sadness to rain and eventually redness. Through the evening thunder, I sat still, trying to simmer. They say there is a beast within every man, and I was taming my beast with music. My earplugs were siphoning the sounds of art of noise, a soothing song called Moments of Love. My sister Naja held her head low. She was responding to our mother Uma's feelings. Like the seven years young that she is, she did not grasp the seriousness of Akemi's disappearance and believed more than Uma and I that Akemi will be coming through the door at any moment. Much later that Sunday night, family day for us, my Uma placed the purple candle in a maroon dish and onto her bedroom floor. She struck a black tip match and it blazed up blue. The subtle scent of lavender released into her air. There in the darkness, I sat on the floor leaning against the wall and listened to her melodic African voice in the expressive Arabic language as she told me for the first time ever the story or should I say, saga of my father's fight to take her as his first bride, true love, and true heart. I knew then that the darkness in her room was intentional. She wanted to shield the sea of her emotions since there was no love more intense than the mutual love between her and my father. She also wanted to subdue my fury. 
She wanted me to concentrate instead on the red and then orange and then blue flame and listen intently for the meaning of her words and the moral of her story so that I would know why I must not fail to bring Akemi back home and why I had to seize victory the same as my father did. Monday, May 5th, 1986 At daybreak, when the moon became the sun, Uma's story was completed. She lay gently on the floor, still dressed in her fuskia tobe. Her hair spread across her arm as she slipped into sleep. Our lives and even our day were both upside down now. I lifted her and placed her onto her bed. I put out the flame that danced on the plate in the middle of mostly melted wax. Uma was supposed to be preparing for work, but her most important job, which took all night, was finally finished. She wanted to transfer my father's strength and intelligence and brave heart to me, her son. She wanted me to know that I must not be halted by my deep love for her, my mother. She had told me, you have guarded my life and built our family business. I love you more than you can ever imagine. In my prayers, I thank Allah every day for creating your soul and giving you life. I thank Allah for choosing to send you through my body. But now, you must follow the trail of your seed. Chapter 2 Naja overslept. When I went into her room to wake her for school, I found her sleeping in the same clothes from yesterday and clutching a doll. The scene was strange. At night, she usually wore her pajamas and a robe and woke up wearing them as well. She didn't play with dolls, wasn't the type, was more into puzzles and pets. As I approached the bed, I saw the doll and had the same hair as my wife, long, black, and thick. That hair is real, I thought to myself, and reached for the doll. I maneuvered it out of Naja's hands and flipped it around. It was a tan-skinned doll with Japanese eyes drawn on with a heavy, permanent black sharpie marker. The material was sewn and held together with a rough and amateurish stitch. Naja woke up and said with a sleepy slur and stutter, I finally made something by myself. She turned sideways in her bed, propping her head up with her hand, and said now with confidence, It's like me, can't you tell? I smile the way a man with troubles on his mind might smile to protect a child's innocent view of the world. I could have easily got tight with my little sister because she had gone into my room and removed the ponytail of her hair that Akemi had chopped off her own head one day in frustration with her Japanese family. It looks like her. You did a good job, I told Naja. Do you really think it looks like your wife? Or are you just saying that to be nice? Naja asked. I'm saying it to be nice. Now get up. You're running late for school today. Akemi's expensive collection of high heels was lined up against the wall in our bedroom. Her hand-painted Nikes and other kicks with colorful laces were spread out too. Her luggage and clothing, every dress and each skirt, a memory of something sweet, were all there. Her black eyeliner pencil that outlined her already dark and beautiful eyes was left out on a desktop. The perfume elixir that Uma made for Akemi, but truly for my pleasure, was there also. The crystal bottle top was tilted to the right from the last use. Her yoga mat was rolled up and lined in the corner. She had left her diary out for all to see. She knew we could not read one word of the Japanese kanji that began on the last page and ended on the first. Yet she had colorful drawings in there as well. Just then, I recalled her fingers gliding down the page with a colored pencil in one hand and a chunk of charcoal in the other. Everywhere in our bedroom, there were signs that this was a woman, a wife who lived here beside me, her husband, 
and definitely intended to stay. We are teenagers, Akemi and I, but we are both sure of our bond. Furthermore, we took that bold and irreversible step into marriage, and our two hearts became one. She had left her designer life and luxurious apartment behind and moved into the Brooklyn projects to be beside and beneath me. So in love, even in the chaos of this hood and the glare of the ambulances and screams of their sirens, she could only see me. Each day her love became more sweeter and her smile even brighter. After hearing Uma's story, I understood now that in the Sudan, my home country, the kidnapping of females is unusual, but has happened, especially when two men were battling over the same woman. A Sudanese man will fight hard and by any means necessary to earn the right and advantage over the next man to marry the bride of his choice and make her his own. Yet our men never battle over a woman after the marriage has already taken place, been witnessed, acknowledged, and agreed on. We never battle to win a woman after her husband has gone her who's nil. The thought alone made my heart begin to race, and my entire body began to sweat like summer. But in the spring season, I looked at my bed sheets that I had never thought about before. Uma has selected those sheets knowing that a man wouldn't mind, but a woman would. She dressed up my bed one day while I was out. Uma wanted Akemi to feel good and welcomed. I had to admit that those Egyptian cotton sheets were soft and comfortable. Only Akemi's skin was softer. Eitida is the word from back home that describes for us a bigger offense. My mind switched to that thought. Aitada happens when a kidnapper steals a woman against her will, then rapes her. I promised myself that in my blood relation beef with my wife's father, this was not that type of problem. Yet, I also knew that when a man is not beside his woman, protecting, loving, providing, and influencing her all the time, Aitada is always possible by any man who is allowed to be in the same room with her. If that man is living low. My sensei taught me the technique of breathing a certain way to lower the blood pressure and calm the mind and settle the heart. It was not a technique meant to prevent a murder. A man has to think, but not too much. Thinking to an extreme can paralyze a man's actions and turn him into a passive coward. What Sensei taught me was a technique meant mainly to calm a warrior to prepare him to make the sharpest, wisest, most effective strike against his target. So I was using it as I stepped swiftly down the subway stairs and out of the spring air. Now it was Monday. My feet were moving rhythmically with my breathing. My game face was neutral, but my soul was scowling. Each time that I cleared my murderous thoughts, they would reappear. Chapter 3 I could easily recognize her from behind. As the pack train swerved and jerked, I caught quick glimpses of her pretty neck and shoulders. Her bare arm was extended upward, graceful like a ballerina's, her hands holding the grip tight lightly like fingers properly placed on piano keys. Seeing nice-looking N.Y. girls was an all-day thing, but it became much more personal when it was a familiar female. Someone whose bedroom I had been in before whose swollen old mendicants I had already seen, a female who had begged me for a kiss and whose infant daughter I had once held in my arms. It was Bangs, and it was a one in a million chance that we would end up on the same train on the same day at the same time, both coming from and going to different places, I was sure. Immediately, I moved away from her, and to my left, my knapsack hitting someone standing next to me. 
I pushed toward the connecting train doors to switch cars. The train car that I moved into was no better. A very tight crowd. But it was better because they were all strangers. There was no risk or emotion in it for me. I saw, your, I saw your reflection on the window glass, Bang said sweetly, suddenly appearing before me. I know you knew it was me. I wanted to see if you would come over by me or not, she said. I didn't answer her. I didn't move or turn. The train screeched to a stop. The conductor's voice boomed out something over a broken speaker. It was some ill transit equipment that never got fixed. He knew it didn't work, and so did all the passengers. Only he knew what he was announcing. As for the rest of us, either you knew where you were headed or you didn't. This is New York, and if there is a problem, it's your problem. Handle it. The train doors opened, and some people got off. I was facing the door and Bang stepped into the now cleared out space and faced me, looking into my eyes. A new crowd pushed in and now Bang's was pressed close up on me. It was a warm day and warmer underground. Only the thin silk of her clothes separated me from her. Ever since I met her, it was like this. Me not expecting to see her, her suddenly appearing, full of life, skin so pretty, Baby oil glistening, and hair clean and pulled up into a bun with bangs framing her eyes. Fourteen years young and already breeded, her body was full of obvious curves and power. I tried to step back, but it wasn't happening. There was nowhere to move. At least if you could see me, you could speak, right, Superstar? A name she had always called me. A woman's way of weakening a man with her non-stop admiration. Her pretty lips were thick and natural, wearing no gloss today. Her eyes were still searching me for answers that I had already given her a thousand times. It didn't matter to her that I am in love and married to someone else. She will keep pushing like the marathon runner she is. No matter what kind of setbacks occurred, she will slow her pace, catch her breath, re-establish her rhythm and stride, and speed up once again, completely convinced that she could win. My mind was clear and straight, but even without looking into her eyes, my body was committing mutiny, heating up at the proximity. The train pulled left and then right. She grabbed my waist to stop herself from being tossed here and there. She kept her left hand on my body. You don't have to say nothing, Superstar. You know you still got my heart. She said softly, yet with bold style. I didn't say nothing in response to her. And I'm not worried about it no more because I have a secret about me and you. I didn't know what the f*** she was talking about. There was no secrets between me and her. There was no saliva, no blood, no sperm or sweat exchanged between us. Okay, maybe some sweat. We had dance pressed together at a party once, but all her secrets were her own. I had told her everything and broke off dealing with her before anything ever really got started between us. I told her that me and her could never be. I even turned down her offers and resisted my feelings to slide my tongue into her mouth. So she had no claim on me. Move, please, she said to the people blocking her exit at the next stop. As she got off, I wondered exactly where she was coming from, but I shut those thoughts down by reminding myself that she wasn't my girl, wife, or responsibility. I knew she was surprised by my silence, maybe even hurt. But what was I supposed to do with her if she kept running up on me like this? I liked her but the sexual feeling that she had swirling around her made me uneasy. It felt like whenever she came around, I had to triple my efforts to ignore and resist. There was one good thing about knowing her, though. Whenever I was the most tensed up, she would make me smile or loosen up with her ways, and for the few minutes that we rode in the train, she paused my murderous thoughts. Yet, 
the moment she disappeared, I forgot her, and they returned. Chapter 4 After I buried the burners, I shot over to the dojo. I knew it might be empty. I wasn't scheduled for a private lesson, and there was no class at the time either. I knew that I might be disturbing my teacher on his downtime, but I felt like fighting somebody. Striking the jaw, kicking the head off, slamming a rival. So I went. Sensei drew back the curtain and checked my face through the thick glass window before unlocking the closed dojo door. A serious and mostly silent man whose eyebrows expressed his thoughts, he stood looking at me like a mind reader before clearing the way for me to step inside unannounced. Rage is the opposite of thought, Sensei said suddenly. I didn't respond. Whoever has put you into this frame of mind has more control over you right now than you have over yourself. If he is your opponent and you will face him today, you will be defeated. I had thought I had my game face on. I just knew I was looking neutral. Obviously, I was wrong. It's not the look on your face. It's your energy. All yang, no yin. Excuse me, I questioned. It's all heat coming off of your body. Too much heat for someone so cool. He managed a slight smile with no laughter accompanying it. Change into your doji, he ordered. After I suited up, Sensei led me into some unfamiliar movements. They were slow, like a strange dance. Not the swift and sharp and precise and lethal movements or kata or caliber and mastery. The movements were so slow that it took a lot of patience for me to execute them. Sensei remained focused and performed the same movements continuously. He didn't stop, so I didn't either. Twenty or thirty minutes in, I felt myself becoming more calm and comfortable. Sixty minutes total, and I was covered with a sheen of sweat and feeling so calm that I could easily ease into a deep sleep. Now we can begin class, Sensei said, tossing me a white hand towel. I tossed it back and used one of the clean white washcloths I kept in my back pocket through the spring and summer season. I wiped my forehead, face, and then neck. He nodded for me to take a seat on the floor and then sat across from me. I waited for him to introduce the material for today's impromptu private lesson. But still, he said nothing. I thought he might be looking for a suki, which is what it is called when an opponent is looking for a means of a surprise attack when the warrior has stupidly left himself open. I leapt back onto my feet, remembering how this sensei had got the better of me in a few encounters. I had told myself that if he attempted to defeat me ever again, I would treat him as an enemy and not as my teacher of seven years and the man who had presided over my wedding, representing my wife and translating her Japanese words, thoughts, and feelings. Yami, Sensei said, meaning at ease or relax. Suate, Sensei ordered, meaning take a seat. He used the Japanese commands that I was accustomed to in our regular group training at the dojo. You have something to ask me. I am waiting to hear it, Sensei said with absolute certainty. For seconds, I searched my mind. I thought I came to this dojo to fight, but obviously my teacher thought I needed his counsel. I was not the type to confide in any other man. My trust was in Allah, my father, myself, and my Uma. For me, there was no one else. I have two best friends, Amir and Chris, but I still kept most things from them. I'm not a liar, but I am an expert at concealing things. So now I sat there calmly, but unwilling to give up any information about my life, my wife, my war. Now you are thinking, Sensei observed. It is so much better than rage. 
I listened to Sensei's words but chose to remain silent. If anyone should understand me, it was him, a ninja, a master of ninjutsu, the art of invisibility, the man who trained me to be a ninja also. We knew well that ninjutsu stands above all other Asian forms, or do, meaning way of life. Ninjutsu is not recreation or sport. It is the supreme art of war, the science of fighting so fiercely and precisely and thoroughly that your enemies are defeated and eliminated and your survival is the only possible outcome. We sat in silence for ten more minutes before Sensei broke it. There are many forms of fighting and fighting happens on many levels. You have been trained most often on a physical level. You have mastered that. You have done very well as a student of weapons also. But there is a form of fighting that happens between thinkers on the thought level. He paused. I guess to let his words sink into my mind. And I was listening and considering what he was saying. I was even noticing how he was using his mind to maneuver around my silence and make the most accurate predictions about what exactly was going on with me. A warrior must know what kind of battle he is going into. If it is physical, we ninjas fight to the finish. We take our enemy down. You know that. But the same way we don't draw our weapons unless we are prepared for the finish, we must know when we are in battle of another kind. He searched my face for reactions. In a thought battle, the superior fighter is the superior thinker. The superior thinker is the warrior with the best plan. Someone who has stepped back and measured all the angles. A thinker who has thought about the situation from his enemy's point of view and determined his enemy's thoughts and moves from the beginning to the end. A thinker must have good sentinels, soldiers on his side who gather information and do reconnaissance. Or as a ninja, in an unpredictable situation, he must know how to gather information quickly by himself. Sensei. Let me get this right, I said, interrupting him. A thought battle will be the type of battle that a fighter is in when he has already decided that murder is not an option, right? Sensei's facial expression changed. We don't speak of murder, he said firmly, yet very quietly. Let us just say that yes, some battles are not physical, so taking down your opponent is not your objective, but winning still is your objective, understand? Of course, I nodded in agreement. After all, this was the kind of battle that I was entering with Akami's father. And through this conversation with my teacher, I really understood, accepted, and confirmed that murder was not an option and that this battle was a thought battle. The only part of this battle that was physical was that at the end, I had to have my wife back into my hands and living in my presence, not his. Then there are spiritual battles. They are the most complex. But to make it simple, let me say that if you are convinced of the truth of your cause, that what you are fighting for is right and true, then you will become capable of gaining the confidence you need to have the upper hand over your opponent on the spiritual level. To be certain of your rightness requires some meditation. When you came into the dojo today, you were without meditation. You were only anger. This is why I led you in a session of Tai Chi, to prepare you to be able to meditate and be certain that you are right in whatever your cause may be. There is always a chance that you are wrong. Meditation will reveal this to you. I listened intently to what he was suggesting. I wondered for a minute if meditation was really so different from prayer. As a Muslim, I pray throughout the day and night. Although, I try not to pray at times when my mind is clouded and angry. Fortunately, most of the time, my mind is not cloudy or angry, just focused. Did you meditate, Sensei? Only sometimes, when necessary. Because most battles are physical, I asked and stated with confidence. Then a natural smile came across my face. And in a physical battle, you have no worries, no reason to meditate or hesitate, right, Sensei? 
and I don't either. I held up my fists to emphasize. We both laughed some. There, it is good to see your smile, Sensei reacted. Your passion and your heart are your assets. The best warriors are passionate, and they use the thunder in their hearts to conquer anyone and to overcome any obstacle that threatens their heart. I thought about his words for some seconds and really asked myself if they were true. In the streets, no one says that a man's passion is good. The streets take passion as a weakness. N work overtime to prove that they are cold, colder, the coldest. So who has threatened your heart? The heart of a newlywed that should be at ease, he asked with a half-smile mixed with a true concern. Maybe he thought that he had relaxed me so successfully that he had eased me into a talkative state. But that wasn't the case. After a momentary pause, he said with a confident and solemn face, Allow me to guess. Your opponent? It is your wife's father, Naoko Nakamura. A man who has many enemies, but even more friends. I didn't smile or shift or acknowledge Sensei's guesses in any way. I couldn't tell him that my new wife was gone, stolen away, even if it was by her own father's doing. It involved too much pain, insult, and yes, shame. In Sudanese tradition, shame is a heavy burden, like wearing a jacket and pants and a hat and even boots, all filled with lead. Do you know him, Sensei? I asked. Naoko Nakamura is neither my friend nor my enemy. We are both Japanese. This is all we have in common. He does not know, or care, that I exist. Then why did you bring his name up and speak on it as if you know him? I asked, unable to shield my general distrust. Every Japanese knows him, especially in my age group. He was born on the day that the Americans dropped a two-ton bomb on the Japanese people of Hiroshima and then Nagasaki. After so much death and sorrow, most Japanese people just wanted peace at any cost. They welcomed the Americans in and didn't fight the occupation. Not Naoko. He lost his father the day he was born. When he became a very young man, he wanted revenge. He worked relentlessly. Was not a physical fighter, but was more clever than a nine-tailed fox. He was a great organizer of men, a real team builder, Japan's extreme patriot and a masterful businessman. So successful that he became known throughout the Asian continent as the man who never surrendered. I resisted bigging Akami's father up in my mind, despite what Sensei was telling me. They sounded true, Sensei's words, but in order to outmaneuver Naoko Nakamura, I had to view him as just another man, nobody's hero or nothing like that. So I stood up. Thank you for today, Sensei. You helped me with my yin-yang, I smiled. I'll see you in class tomorrow night. Now I gotta go. I turned and headed toward my locker, but he paused me with his words, a final lesson of the day, I figured. Scholars have written books about Naoko. He is a very intelligent and accomplished man. When I saw his stamp and signature on your marriage documents, I thought, what are the chances of a young man from Brooklyn marrying the only daughter of this Japanese tycoon and legend? It seemed impossible. In fact, there was more of a chance of me witnessing a solar eclipse. He smiled. His words were a strange mixture of him giving me props while at the same time taking them away. After a quick thought, I believed that I figured out what he was really trying to ask me. What were the chances of a talented, rich, and beautiful Japanese teenage girl like Akemi, who didn't speak any English, marrying a black African like me, living in the Brooklyn projects in the Brooklyn hood, who doesn't speak Japanese? But his question didn't matter to me like it might have mattered to some other black American. I don't have one drop of inferiority in my blood or mind. I did marry her, and she married me eagerly. It wasn't no mystery. It had happened right before Sensei's eyes in this dojo with his help and many witnesses. 
I shrugged my shoulders, shaking off the tightness that tried to creep back in. I bounced back to my Brooklyn block with only my hands as my weapons. I had no doubt that if anybody tried to test me today, they would receive the full impact of my skill and fury. As soon as I hit my block, I could taste death in the air. There was talk of a kid in the next building who had just gotten slaughtered. First his man was killed. Instead of murking his man's murderer, he snitched to the Jake. Two days later, he got to join his man in heaven or hell. I knew there would be a trail of bodies turning up any day, any minute now. Snitching always resulted in the blizzard of blood. I had moved my guns and kunai because of nausea. When she went into my room without permission and went through my things to find Nakami's ponytail, it meant two things to me. One, it meant that it wasn't her first time going through my things. She was looking for the ponytail that she already knew was there. Two, it meant that she could have easily hurt herself if she came upon one of my burners or tools. Instead of getting more strict with her, I just accepted that she was at an age of being curious. It was easier to move the danger out of her way than to rely on the fact that she wouldn't do it again if I asked her not to. Anyway, I could never forgive myself if I allowed anything bad to happen to my younger sister. Chapter 5 Back in my room, I pulled down the blanket that I kept folded, and in the top corner of my closet, I unfolded it on my bed and then felt around the hemline. I ripped over the hem carefully and retrieved my three diamonds that Uma had sewn securely into the ragtag blanket. It had been my idea to store the diamonds this way. I thought a safety deposit box at the bank was too accessible to employees and higher-ups and the diamonds were too valuable to me to risk it. Buying a vault for our apartment was too obvious because the streets watch you bring it in and plot all day, every day for a way to get it out. Putting diamonds into my mattress or anywhere any criminal would look automatically was dumb. So I kept the beautiful blankets that Uma crocheted for me on my bed and kept this cheap hospital issue blanket that Uma had received when Naja was born in the closet. I knew this blanket would never receive a second glance or be stolen by anyone, so it made a perfect decoy. I had planned to store the diamonds there till forever. I had hoped to one day hand these three diamonds to my own son, Inshallah the same way that my father had gifted them to me seven years ago. That's how it works with a family heirloom. It is not the same as money, a person that's inherited, or a piggy bank that you go in and out of, or even a savings account that you keep for a while with the intention of spending in the near future. An heirloom is something that gets passed from generation to generation. It is something cherished, the same as these diamonds were not only because of their value, but because there were lessons from my father. In my lifetime, I could work and eventually go and get more diamonds. But they would not be the same African diamonds that my father gave me in the Sudan, along with his lessons and heart and intentions and instructions. For those reasons alone, they could never be replaced. But my father did say that the three carat diamonds were three wishes. Use them when everything and everyone else around you fails or when you feel trapped. I knew that Naoko Nakamura had me trapped at the moment. But I also knew that I wouldn't allow him to hold me there for long. I would use at least one of the three wishes to go get my wife. It could be said that my using the diamond was the same as giving the diamond to my son. 
I was not too young to know that if I had a son in this world, he would be wherever my wife was, resting in the comfort of her womb. I rode in with Uma. She had to catch the four to midnight shift at the Brooklyn Textile Factory since she missed her usual work time slot. We did not talk much. Uma is the kind of woman who doesn't repeat herself or nag. She knew I understood what must be done and she would wait to hear my plan and add her thoughts later on. Besides those midnights when I pick her up from her job or when some of our best ideas and plans are hatched. After I was sure she was straight at her job, I headed to Manhattan to the Diamond District to find a reasonable jeweler among thieves to buy at least one of my diamonds. Six was the magic number. I had seen six jewelers by six o'clock, the time when the jewel merchants generally start feverishly packing to leave the heavily guarded area. I was not satisfied with even one of the six negotiations or offers. I knew what my father's gems were worth. I decided I would come back early the next morning and push until I found the right deal. That same evening, moving east away from 47th and Avenue of Americas, where many of the jewels from around the world are stored and bought and sold wholesale and retail, I made a left onto Park Avenue. I strolled up the full length of the blocks. I looked around carefully, checking out the discreetly placed hotels that lined that expensive area. They weren't well known like the Marriott, Hilton, Hyatt, and Ramada. I liked that. They were more exclusive, even though their nightly price tag was more than I could afford without cashing in at least one of my diamonds. I had to find the right location to place Uma and Naja while I was away in Japan. I already knew that I would not leave them alone in Brooklyn in the projects. We had only two weeks remaining before we could move into our new house in Queens, which we had bought using the money that we earned together from Uma Designs, our family business. Uma, an incredible seamstress and an expert in fabrics and textiles and designs, had created and sold enough clothing, hats, upholstery, curtains, and so on to bring in $80,000 over a five-year period. I had managed, marketed, and served as the sales, communication, and delivery person for our company. Now, even in this crisis, the bottom line was that until I was certain that Uma was safe, I couldn't leave the city. As much as I love my wife in my heart, and in my blood, and even in my bones, Uma will forever be my first love, my mother, and my purpose. After a while, I located a place called The Inn, a small hotel in a four-story brick building on Park. The manager was polite enough to show me a suite without seeming to suspect I was a criminal, like most small business managers and owners instinctively suspect and treat black males. A brief tour, and I became sure that this place had the right feeling, the right amount of space, and cleanliness, as well as a small kitchen for Uma's use. Immediately outside of the hotel was an upscale deli and a low-key pharmacy. The hefty price was $350 per night. When I heard the quote, it made me lean back. Then I regained my composure by guaranteeing myself that I will only be gone for three to five days and that this place would help me feel at ease enough to do whatever I had to do to retrieve my wife. Mike Mountain, I want to give a special shout out to Ralph Anthony Garcia of the United Ronin Networks at YouTube. Make sure y'all go to the United Ronin Networks at YouTube. Check out his channel. Check out his series, Ralph Reads. Give it a like. Subscribe to his channel. And um, check out what he got to offer. Some really good stuff up there. This is 
Mike Mountain and this message is approved by me. Peace. You're now experiencing the Renpet Phenomenon, an Afrofuturistic book series. Afrofuturism is the cure to sci-fi. Download now and experience melanin biotechnology. Bahalapantis, a magnetizing manly musk hinted with a splash of lightly sweet floral scents that are native to North America. Perfectly engineered to turn heads and tickle her olfactory nerves. No poles are needed when fishing at the pub, but don't forget the bait. Mahalapantis, a 30 milliliter bottle gives you about 600 modest sprays of this new technology to convenience the alpha man on you. Bahalapantis, get your bottle today. Bahalapantis.